our topic today is the book of Daniel as pious fraud. And so that's maybe a little bit of a um, provocative title for some people. Maybe for other people it's like, okay, that's not that provocative. I'm assuming that <laughs> to begin with. Um, this in a way is a, a follow-up, if you were here a couple weeks ago, to our lecture that we had on apocalypses and apocalypticism because we were talking then about the genre in general and uh, the apocalyptic mindset and that kind of thing. And now what we're looking at is one of the earlier or uh, uh, more influential apocalypses, uh, one of the apocalypses that actually made it into the canon of the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament, the book of Daniel. <coughs> okay, so we're starting with one of our timelines. <laughs> And this is filled with all kinds of information and detail, but we can, it's nice to kind of map it all out in order to um, kind of understand the time frame of this whole uh, topic that we're looking at. So we're going here from uh, 600 before the Common Era or BC, uh, BCE, till, um, you know, in the first century uh, CE, the Common Era or the Christian Era or AD as we often say. So, um, and what we're looking at then, that time period, um, specifically anyway, from 586, which is the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem, and the end of what's called then the first temple period of Judaism, so the earliest development of Judaism, uh, to the period that's called the Babylonian captivity, which is the few generations that the nobles of Jerusalem were spending in exile in the city of Babylon in the Babylonian Empire to the, at that point, the conquest of the Babylonians by the Persians and the edict uh, by Cyrus that the exiles could go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, but now have that be, instead of a kingdom, have it be a much smaller uh, poor province of the Persian Empire where the Persians are really running the show. Um, and then uh, through the end of then the Persian period when Alexander and the Macedonians and Greeks overthrew the Persian Empire, uh, the succession that happens afterwards, so this Hellenistic period when uh, Alexander's generals divide his empire and specifically in this area of Judea, Palestine, um, they are fighting between uh, the two generals, uh, successors, Ptolemy and Seleucus. Ptolemy, who is ruling over Egypt, and Seleucus, who is in more or less the bulk heartland of the Persian Empire, but it's Syria, Mesopotamia, and Iran. Down through then, um, uh, when so initially that whole original period for Judea is that the Egyptians who are right next door are in charge. But then in the second century BCE, the king of uh, the Seleucid king, so essentially the king of Syria, conquers uh, the territory from the Egyptians. And so then the, the accompanying problems with that that includes um, the sack of Jerusalem in 169, which is going to be very important to this story. And then the revolt that happens that, that leads to an establishment of an independent Judean kingdom under sometimes called the Maccabees, uh, the Hasmonean dynasty. So we can see that here, the Hasmoneans. And then followed by their successors, the Herodians. So Herod the Great and his successors. And meanwhile, as the Hellenistic world is slowly uh, uh, conquered by the Romans, the Romans then assume control then over the Hasmonean, the Herodian kingdom at the end of that, and ultimately in another uh, Jewish revolt, this time against Roman authority, the second temple then in the year 70 is destroyed, ending the second temple period. So hopefully that all is kind of clear. So just for the context of the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel is set in the time periods uh, of the Babylonian captivity and shortly thereafter, uh, so shortly after the Persians are, take control. And then, uh, however, we're going to argue that the earliest components maybe of the text are in the, let's say, 200s BCE and the um, 
part that we can definitely date <laughs> uh, uh, for sure is written around 165 BCE. And there may be some other parts that were written a little bit later. But in any event, we, we'll talk about all the rest of how all the different parts are composed. Does that all make sense? Is that all clear? OK, so that's some setting of the stage. So to start out, when we're talking about this book of Daniel, so the book of Daniel is the last um, book to be composed that, that actually then makes it into the canon of the, um, of the Hebrew Bible. So, uh, so uh, there's no other books there that, there are books that are scripture-like that many people, for example, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls people had more books of scripture as what they considered scripture than made it into the Bible. And some of those are older than Daniel. They also had Daniel because they thought it was a really cool book. <laughs> and they have, I think, eight copies of it uh, in Qumran in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But um, they, um, uh, that's the last one to be composed, especially in its present format, uh, to the actually make it into the Hebrew Bible. There are some other um, later texts uh, that make it into the, the Septuagint, which is to say the Catholic or Orthodox Christian Old Testament, but the Hebrew Bible and also the Protestant Old Testament, this is the, the most recent one to be written. So there's two different versions of the book as we have it today. So we have the version that is, in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew and Aramaic version of the text. It starts in Hebrew, it goes to Aramaic, and then it concludes again in, in Hebrew, uh, in the text as we have it. And then we have a longer version of the book that is entirely in Greek, and that's from the Greek um, version, the very early translation called the Septuagint, that is made in the second and first centuries BCE in Egypt for Greek-speaking uh, Judeans or Jews. Uh, and so this longer version includes all of this part, although both the Aramaic and the Hebrew then are translated to Greek, and then it includes additional stories that aren't in this text. So it's kind of an interesting text we have, therefore, because we talk a lot about how some of these ancient texts are created. And when we have two different versions, <laughs> That also gives us way more clues into how the individual text was formed than we would otherwise have. So we have that same thing between um, the Christian New Testament with the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, because we have multiple versions of related texts, so three different versions, we are able to tell much more clearly how those texts were, were composed between each other than we are able to tell, for example, with the Gospel of John, which we also assume is a growth out of multiple different versions and authors, but we don't have any, all we have is the complete, completed whole, so we can't tell for sure. It remains hypothetical, right? So in this case, we can tell uh, a lot more. So. Specifically, um, um, what we have here with Daniel, um, you know, we've talked before about how lots of different texts in the Bible do that, right? So we can see the seams and the different voices that underlie the Torah itself, which is to say the Pentateuch, the five books attributed to Moses. We can see that with the books with other lectures we've had on Proverbs, on Job, on the epistle Second Peter, and like I say, the Gospels. Daniel, though, is kind of helpful because it's really obvious <laughs> because we have three different languages here, right? So we have um, probably here what is an originally an Aramaic book that gets expanded by an author who adds parts in Hebrew without translating the Aramaic part to Hebrew. Hebrew and Aramaic are related languages, and so um, in a lot of cases, the um, scholars who are reading Hebrew and able to read Hebrew at this time also no Aramaic, and so they don't have the need then to translate uh, the Aramaic into Hebrew. Uh, and so anyway, there's the Aramaic would have been the common tongue that everybody was speaking. The Hebrew is the more ancient tongue that has died out but is still being used as a religious language because of texts, and in any way they're related. And then we have finally this Greek version that includes parts that we only have the Greek for because there are no Hebrew or Aramaic versions of those stories that are inserted. So is that clear? So it makes it so that in this particular case, we can see this expansion so much more clearly than we can with a lot of other 
texts. So if we go back then to that first text, probably that Aramaic text, um, this components or these components of the Daniel as we have it are written in Aramaic, which was the state language of the Persian Empire in Mesopotamia and the Levant. Prior to that had been the kind of state language of the uh, Babylonian Empire. It's, init it's a Semitic language, like I say, it's related to Hebrew, related to Arabic. Uh, it's all of those languages are interrelated with each other, but it's different enough that it, you know, it's, a, it's its own different language. And so um, at a certain point, um, as we see it said, uh, Hebrew dies out as the regular spoken tongue and everybody in the area ends up speaking Aramaic because it's therefore the language, the lingua franca, as we say, um, the common tongue like you know, English. And so if everybody at a certain point, um, let's say 100 years from now, right now everybody in the Netherlands maybe, which is a, the closest language that's related to English right now, they're all pretty well bilingual and they all speak English and Dutch. Um, at some point or other, they may all just stop speaking Dutch because they're just, if English continues to take root, and that would just be because uh, it's simply easier to do that, right? Hope not. Well, we maybe hope that won't happen, but anyway, it's possible that it would happen. That kind of thing happens a lot, right? Yeah. Certainly, um, uh, Egyptian, um, the Egyptian language, which Coptic, um, when after the Arab conquest, it's, it continues both of them together for a whole long time. At a certain point, Coptic dies out and is only a liturgical language, or just to say the church language of the uh, Christians of Egypt. Okay. okay, so taking this then, this original Aramaic portion of Daniel, it's, we don't know exactly when it's written, but let's, it's either, let's say, the late 3rd or early 2nd century BCE. It's probably by... Judean or Jewish exiles who are living in the Hellenistic Seleucid Kingdom. <laughs> so um, well, that's going to require a little explanation. You guys may all have all these Hellenistic kingdoms all down, but we're going to try to go through it a little bit. <laughs> so essentially, if we go to that time period, that uh, second century uh, BCE, this is actually a little bit earlier than that, um, in the division of the Persian Empire and the Greek world that occurred after Alexander the Great's death, um, there emerged then some important kingdoms, the Seleucid Kingdom and the Ptolemaic Kingdom. The Seleucid Kingdom is kind of the bar bulk of what had been the Persian Empire and the Ptolemies are off in Egypt, but they also have a fleet which allows them to control uh, and dominate the sea here. And so for the t period, the place uh, for example, in Jerusalem, you can see it's on the frontier between these two empires, which are constantly fighting with each other to decide who is going to have control or be the dominant player in the post-Alexander world. And so, <coughs> for uh, Jews, for the Judeans, part of the situation has been, since that first Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, there have been uh, Jewish exile communities in Babylon, it's that Babylonian captivity we're talking about, but there were also were exiles in Egypt right from the earliest time. And with the establishment of Alexandria, uh, the city that Alexander uh, uh, founds as the new capital of Ptolemaic Egypt, um, that becomes a major center for a Jewish diaspora community and indeed um, at a certain point it, this, in this Hellenistic period, that is the largest um, Jewish community that there is. So there's many, Alexandria is such a huge city and it has such a big Jewish percentage of the population. There's many more Jews than that are living there than live in Jerusalem. Uh, likewise, since Babylon and then later Seleucia, these um, capitals of the Seleucid Empire are again such big cities and they have such big Jewish communities in a way that those are also bigger and more important than the people that are in what's functionally quite a little province that's not very important. And so in the Seleucid Kingdom, because there's already this lingua franca of Aramaic, that continues to be spoken. It's impossible to get everybody in that whole area to speak Greek, whereas the, um, they don't really care about Aramaic in Egypt, and so they continue to have Coptic, the Egyptian language, but the Jews then here more or less all switch to Greek. So they would be kind of bilingual in terms of knowing Aramaic, but also um, there's still a lot of Hellenization, so there's also knowledge of Greek going on in the Seleucid Kingdom, but in um, the Ptolemaic Kingdom, the Aramaic has died out. <coughs> 
Okay, so what are these stories about? <laughs> so we're talking now about this Aramaic text, which I'm suggesting is probably then from over here. So uh, because it's written in Aramaic, it's probably not coming from Egypt, so it's either coming from Jerusalem or more likely in this case, the diaspora, so it's probably coming from the folks over here in Babylon. So it's largely, um, and when we read this portion of the text, it's largely exploits of Judean nobles that are in the diaspora, which is to say in exile. So they're not the people that are living in the land, and it's specifically set uh, in uh, Babylon. So um, there's exiled Judean nobles. They're in the courts of the kings of Babylon and Persia, where they become um, high officials in the governments of those uh, kingdoms. They may well originally have been <coughs> courtly stories. And so as opposed to um, when you have a, you sometimes when we think of the Bible, we think of them entirely as, entirely as being religious stories. And so that's where we think that maybe um, it's the authors are prophets and priests. But some of the stories are um, written to entertain nobles. And so then they are interested in the things that nobles are interested in. And these are what we call courtly stories, uh, stories of court and court intrigue. And these often are stories that are more interesting to us today than what all the priests are concerned with. Priests often are concerned with ritually, you have to do this and that, and there can't be any blemish. And you have to, you know, when you're going to bring the goat to the temple, it has to be on this day and this and that and all these requirements. Uh, whereas the nobles don't care about that, and, and we rarely do today either. <laughs> you know? And so um, these are the more interesting stories from a narrative standpoint. Okay, <clears throat> so that, that's the original part, and we'll look at it in a little more detail in the course of this lecture. But um, we'll now look then, there's a, the expanded text. So somebody took that original text and added uh, Hebrew portions of it. And so the original Aramaic texts were expanded by what we call a redactor, which is another way of saying an ancient editor, um, somebody who is not only, though, editing, but also, you know, so they could be deleting but, and changing, but they are often usually just expanding. So a lot of times if a book is really important to an ancient person, they'll keep the original book fairly intact in the middle, and then they'll continue to add stuff in between. In part, this is because every single time you have to make a book in the ancient world, you have to write it all out by hand anyway. And so if you, um, there's a book you love, you could, for example, have written a new beginning to it, then you, ha then you write out a copy of your whole, the whole part as it already exists, and so then you can write a whole new end uh, at the end, and that would just be part of the process of more or less copying the book, since you have to copy it anyway in order to have a second one, right? So um, because, however, the redactor here composed the text in Hebrew and didn't translate that Aramaic portion, um, we're just able to see a lot more obviously where the one part starts and the other part ends. So if, um, uh, if we didn't have that, you know, again, the, the inclusion of the two parts would remain hypothetical, right? So um, where we don't have a, um, you know, seams that are absolutely obvious um, like this, uh, it, even if it seems like, like with the um, documentary hypothesis of the Torah or Pentateuch that we had a lecture on a couple months ago, even where it seems like the, the J source has such a strong voice that's entirely different from what the priestly source sounds like, and you can almost, just even not even knowing any of the Hebrew, just reading the English, once you get the characteristics of the priestly source, you can almost always say, that's the priestly <laughs> author. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's entirely hypothetical, right? Because we don't have, um, we don't, it's not like the language changes and it's not like we have a copy that has survived of just the J text all by itself, which would show us that for sure that that's the way it was. Instead, we have the mishmash as we have it all together and we have to, scholars have to kind of say, well, this is where the one source ends or not. And other scholars can say, you guys are crazy. It's all one text, <laughs> you know? And so anyway, in this case, uh, they can also say that. They can say well, the author, for some reason, wrote a whole bunch in Hebrew and then wrote a whole bunch in Aramaic and then wrote a whole bunch in Hebrew. It, it's the, in this particular case, uh, the onus is really on the person making that argument to explain why that happened, because it does seem really crazy or weird. <laughs> but, you know, it's completely, that's a theory that a person can make. How do you know about the dates? How do I know about the dates? Uh, we're going to talk about the dates. <laughs> and so so we, I'm actually making here that this redactor is actually working between 167 and before 164, which is 
um, very precise compared to what we were able to do with even the rest of it, right? So the Aramaic text, text, all we can say is it's sometime before the 167, been probably like within, it could be quite quickly within, but it could be as much as 50 or 60 years before or something like that. So um, we'll look at the context then of these Hebrew editions in order to explain that dates. So uh, we mentioned that there's those two Hellenistic empires that are at war with each other in this century, um, the, the Seleucid Empire and the um, Ptolemies. So the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. So what ended up happening by this time, that original giant territory that the Seleucids had, um, they lost a whole bunch of the eastern portion of that. So in the first place, there is a Greco-Bactrian kingdom um, that breaks off in what's now Afghanistan, and it forms a very strong and kind of crazily way far east uh, Greek kingdom, <laughs> you know, in, in, in anyway, what's now Afghanistan. And then in kind of the Persian homeland, a group of uh, related Iranian peoples, nomadic people, warriors, the Parthians are able to uh, conquer an area and kind of found what's essentially on a, a renewed Persian empire, although it's different because the Parthians are aren't really a Persian people, but they're a related people. And so it's no longer part of the Hellenistic world, although it's had a lot of Greek influence. Uh, and so then with that kind of loss of that eastern um, direction, the Seleucids, although that makes them less powerful, it does make them a little more focused. <laughs> and so they're able to focus and bring their attention to bear on the west a lot more, and that allows them to conquer um, uh, Palestine, Judea from uh, the Ptolemies. So they took that from Ptolemaic Egypt in 198 BC. So the struggle between um, uh, now the locals, so there's local factions, uh, Judean factions or Jewish factions in terms of ruling uh, Jerusalem itself. And their factions split, generally speaking, along the lines of people who are really in favor of Hellenization and then people who are in favor of less Hellenization, although it's generally portrayed as people who are against Hellenization. But in, in actually case, uh, both groups are actually you know, participating in that Hellenic con uh, context. So Alexander the Great conquered this whole area, and as a result of that, that has changed how everybody's viewing um, uh, civilization, uh, science, philosophy, all of these kinds of things. And, um, and essentially the question for the people you know, Jewish people everywhere, so whether they're in the diaspora, in living in Alexandria or Baghdad, but it's also, not Baghdad, Babylon. <laughs> so those cities, um, you know, move, you know, they refound them very close to each other. Um, but the different cities are Seleucia, Ctesiphon, um, Babylon, and then later Baghdad. But in any event, um, the, uh, uh, the question is how far to, should we retain our traditional identity? Um, as Judeans and following um, our own texts and also uh, Jewish law, and then how, how much should we embrace this cosmopolitan identity of uh, Hellenism, uh, the Greeks, that everybody all around us has done. And so, um, in the middle of that, um, the fa one of the factions, essentially the um, traditionalist faction, overthrow uh, uh, a supporter of the governor of um, that Antiochus has left in Jerusalem. He gets really angry. He's already in a bad mood because he lost this big battle against Ptolemy. And so on his way home from the war, as he has his entire army, you know, even though they have just lost a big, bigger war, they're able to occupy Jerusalem and sack it uh, in punishment for, be, you know, having rebellion uh, against him at, at kind of a critical moment. And so, um, anyway, as a result of that, uh, Antiochus IV uh, sides with the kind of very radical Hellenizers and actually then takes it way further. So what he does then is sack Jerusalem. He refounds it as a Greek city. So now it's going to um, not maintain Jewish law or Jewish traditions and instead is going to have all of the uh, Greek traditions of the gymnasium and all these other kinds of um, Greek institutions. And the temple on the Temple Mount uh, is uh, re-consecrated to Zeus, and a statue of Zeus is set up in it. And so that's um, 
obviously not what especially traditionalists <laughs> will have wanted. Uh, Antiochus then outlaws traditional Jewish rites and practices. And so as a result of that, it's kind of a very strong uh, statement of we are going to Hellenize you and we are going to persecute anybody who isn't going to get on board with this. Uh, so that is the immediate context of then the Hebrew additions. So the desecration of the temple in the year 167 BCE is the immediate context. Um, the Hebrew text uh, <coughs> very accurately <laughs> and explicitly predicts all of those actions of Antiochus IV all the way up to the year 167 when that desecration happens. And so we'll get and we'll see how close it is when it tracks in this lecture, but essentially that author predicts that very closely in the pink versions here, the pink texts. Okay, then, then there are also then, like we say, the Greek additions to the text. And we can tell this because we have the two versions that have been preserved, right? So the expanded text was very, very popular. It found its way to diaspora Jewish communities, Judean communities in Alexandria, which I mentioned has become the largest community. And it's translated into Greek as part of that Septuagint, that very famous early canon where all of the Hebrew Bible, much larger version of texts than ultimately make it in the canon of rabbinic Judaism, um, are all translated and become part of the Septuagint, which is just Greek for 70, based on the idea that 70 scholars, Jewish scholars, kind of mythically, it didn't really happen, but anyway, translated it all in, I think, really fast, maybe 70 days too, but anyway, <laughs> that they all mythically translated it and, so that it could be put in the library, right? So the Library of Alexandria, the famous library. I think they're all supposed to have gotten it exactly the same. Yeah, so the comment is, is that they each individually do it, and then they all, tra and, and then when they compare notes, it's exactly the same. And in fact, because of that story being there, so that myth is actually written into, and there's a book that's, um, that's part of the Septuagint that describes that story. And as a result of that one, that influenced um, lots of different popular myths about the King James scholars. And so, um, so there's the same, that, that same story is repeated. Once you got a good story, it gets repeated into the new context, right? And so the King James scholars did exactly the same thing according to myth, which is to say that um, it put them all, the King James put them all in different rooms. They all translated it all separately or whatever, and when they compared the notes, it all turned out exactly the same. But we know very clearly that that didn't happen because we have actually their notes and we have also the source text that they used, and so we're very much more aware of how it worked for the King James translation. Although we're actually quite aware of the Septuagint as well, which it happens over the course of centuries. It didn't happen just all in 70 days or whatever. Um, so it is a, um, it's a very important as a very early text and indeed for um, all of the Jews of the diaspora in the West, so from Alexandria on westward, they are not using Hebrew anymore as religious language even. They, they're reading their scriptures in Greek. And so, um, anyway, the Septuagint. So because the entire version then of the Septuagint Greek version, so if that's all we had, you know, it's all in Greek because they translated the whole thing into Greek. So it's all there. We can, though, however, we can identify um, that which part is the added material because we have these parts. <laughs> you know, so because we have this is Greek and that's Greek and that's not in the Hebrew Aramaic version, we can tell where those seams are and where those insertions have happened, right? And so if, again, we only had that... Um, Septuagint, and it's all Greek, this, this chart down here would be entirely hypothetical, right? Because we wouldn't have those linguistic seams. Uh, it would just be, but, and so the reason why I want to highlight that is because there's so many times where I'm going to say literary criticism has kind of showed us out of this text that it has these 20 different parts or whatever it is, but, but it's all just a hypothetical construction based on, you know, literary analysis. In, the, in this case, this is one of these mini books that we have that are actually showing um, the validity of that kind of conjecture and that kind of hypothesis, because in this case, we actually have the text to prove it. So Alexandria, it's become the capital of the Ptolemies. It's home of the great library and the museum, the original museum, which is to say uh, the temple of learning dedicated to the muses, the uh, goddesses of science in the Greek uh, pantheon. <coughs> 
The city became then this leading center of culture in the Hellenistic world. It's also home to the largest community of Judeans, of diaspora Jews anywhere in the world. So the Greek version, and we'll look at this part first, it includes a bunch of unrelated texts. So unlike, um, as we'll get back to the, the Hebrew expansion where it was a very deliberate idea, an expansion and editing by one particular author, in this case, it looks more like um, they took that original Hebrew Aramaic um, Daniel and then they took a bunch of other Daniel texts that are already exist that maybe they had and they just spliced them all together kind of willy-nilly and, uh, and, and added them into this. And so these include the prayer of Azariah, the song of the three Jews, the story of Susanna and the elders, the story of the idol bell, and the story of Daniel and the dragon. And so it's a bunch of different Daniel stories that um, get thrown in there. And there are, they, many of them may be actually older <laughs> than some of the rest of Daniel. So, so a lot of these may actually go back to before the Hebrew versions of the book of Daniel, in fact. And in some cases, like the prayer of Azariah, we don't know. It could well be that it's based on a Hebrew original. We don't have it. All we have is the, so people make arguments whether, um, let's say, the Hebrewisms in, in the text are because it's a translation from Hebrew or because the Greek writer who's Jewish is copying the Greek that would be, you know, uh, have Hebrewisms because it's how they translated the rest of the canon, right? So in the same way that you could write, um, if you were just really versed in the King James Bible, you could write new scripture in King Jamesy English, and you could say, and which would also have all of these different kind of Hebrewisms because it's how the King James people um, rendered um, some of the Hebrew for the Old Testament anyway, not the New Testament. Um, it would still nevertheless be an original English composition even if it includes some of those things, right? Okay, so let's look at just a couple of these stories. We've talked about some of these before um, when we've looked at the Apocrypha and other lectures, but there's a bunch of great stories. So one of them is the story of Susanna and the elders. So in this story, two elders from the Judean exile community in Babylon conspire to have their way with a noble Jewish woman named Susanna while she is all by herself bathing in a garden. So they hide out in the garden knowing that she's going to be there when she, they send the servant, when she sends her servant away. Uh, you know, they come out and, and more or less say they want to have their way with her. Uh, and if they don't, because there's two of them, they're going to testify against her that, that they had caught her with um, you know, like a, a young lover who had absconded away, and so then she's going to certainly be shamed and maybe put to death based on their testimony. Uh, however, rather than submit to this um, proposal, this fait accompli, she cries out with the idea that she'd prefer to die than to, um, and even if she's condemned that way and be stoned, she'd rather have that than to, you know, to sin and have her be damned. Uh, and so Daniel, um, so when they are all arrested then, um, this is, becomes like a an early kind of Daniel as a early private eye. <laughs> They're brought before Daniel who's able to ferret out the truth by taking each one of the elders separately and then cross-examining them about their story. And when it turns out their details of their stories don't match, Daniel's able to say, oh, you guys are making this up. <laughs> you guys are not credible. Susanna's the one that is telling the truth. And so I think they get stoned <laughs> uh, as opposed to her. So fun story. Um, likewise, the stories of the idol bell and uh, uh, Daniel and the dragon. So Daniel, again, is a de detective here. His work um, in the case of the idol bell proves to King Cyrus um, that it's actually his own priests that are eating offerings that are left for an idol, an idol to the god bell, each night. And so essentially, um, the priests have this giant feast and all this flagons of, of wine and everything like that that are left every night and the fact it, and then they seal the temple up and the next morning all the feast and all the wine and everything like that's gone and that's proving as far as Cyrus is concerned that the, the bell's a real god <laughs> because he's drinking all this wine and eating all this food. And so Daniel uh, leaves flour on the floor <laughs> Uh, and so then when all the, you know, when they close it all up and all the priests use the secret entrances to go in and have this whole big feast and then leave, uh, when they reopen the, the, uh, the temple the next morning, uh, there's all the priest's footprints on, on, in, the, in the flower. 
and so that proves they ate it, <laughs> you know. And so then Daniel's allowed to, uh, you know, chop up the idol and destroy the idol and kill all the priests. <laughs> so anyway, Another yes. Fun <laughs> Another fun story. Shaheen. Um, a lot of these stories seem to have a very major misunderstanding of how pagan worship works and how pagans. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so this is a this is a polemic. So the the story of the idol bell, yeah, it's gotten cold. Uh, the story of the idol bell is a um, polemic written by um, well, written specifically by Jews, <laughs> but in second Tem people in Second Temple Judaism who are um, uh, opposed to having statues in worship, right? So there is always the, um, the feeling that, uh, so there's different religions that are more or less iconoclastic, and so iconoclastic meaning not wanting images in worship. So uh, people are concerned, have been concerned a lot of times that if you have an image, then you'll worship the image and you'll be fixated on that, uh, and that would be true whether it's an icon, which is to say a painting, whether it is a statue, uh, and so in some cases, um, uh, the uh, iconoclasm can get quite strong. So in Judaism, you're not at a certain point not even allowed to say the name of God anymore. And so you have to, you can spell out the four letters, but it's not to be pronounced. And so when you get to that place in the Torah scroll, um, you say Lord instead of saying the name and otherwise also not to be pictured or anything like that. It's also very strong in Islam uh, where um, you are not to, you can say the name of God, but you can't say uh, or you can say God as the God, you know, being um, that word for God, but you uh, can't picture, right? And so um, Eastern Orthodoxy had a whole war over this called the Iconoclast War. Uh, they settled on, they would keep the icons, which is to say the paintings, but they got rid of all the statues. And then um, Western Christians, Latin Christians were like, what are you people talking about? We're keeping our statues, <laughs> you know? And so anyway, uh, but then the Protestants got rid of them, right? So anyway, so it's, it's a, at a certain point, the Protestants in the Reformation, um, uh, all across England and in Germany, they, they, they defaced all the statues and things like that. They got rid of all the statues and they um, took all the frescoes and they whitewashed it. And so the churches, you know, had to, um, you know, be, if you go to some Protestant churches, it's a white pole barn, right? Because you can't have uh, you can't have it again. So, so it depends. So it, it is a it's a it's a concern. Anyway, so this idea of it is though, um, <clears throat> in a polemic, is that people, for example, that Hindus who use um, statues in their worship of the divine, so the different um, divinities that are understood to depending on how anyway the Hindu theology is very diverse. But in any event, there's a sense um, uh, that people who are not, who go to a Hindu temple, and if you are maybe Muslim or if you are Christian, you think that people are worshiping the statue because the statue is being clothed and bathed, is ha having food left there and that kind of thing. But this is not the idea of it. So despite the fact that the text here um, makes that case, instead it's simply understood that maybe um, the god spark or um, favor is essentially being focused in here, uh, but it is not that the statue is the god. <laughs> so similarly, so that's the idol bell, the great fun story. <laughs> Another one is uh, that's next to it uh, in the story of Daniel and the dragon. So the Babylonians have a dragon. <laughs> so who knew there's actual dragon in the Bible, right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, and so they worship the dragon as a living God, but Daniel just proves it's a, just a dumb animal. <clears throat> and so because essentially he feeds the dragon uh, all these cakes that he's had a secret recipe. <laughs> uh, and so when the dragon eats all these cakes, then the, dra the cakes explode and burst the poor creature's belly open. And so poor creature dies, but proves that it wasn't God, right? Because you know, how could you trick <laughs> God? So it's not as fun a story because now there's, now now the dragons are extinct. <laughs> they got one left in Game of Thrones. So, okay. So here's then just to like we've gone through kind of in a more detail the um, the Greek editions. In addition to that, there's um, a text called the Prayer of Azariah and the Song of the uh, Three Hebrews, and so. Um, that is essentially poems that are talking about the fiery furnace story, and we'll talk about that. 
Um, so essentially in the version that we have that includes the Septuagint, so we have two versions, one that has the Greek parts and one that doesn't have the Greek parts, but they're otherwise the same, except generally speaking, except for the additions. So as we have it, uh, I'm not numbering those because I'm using the chapter numbers from the, from the ones that don't have the Greek, right? <laughs> so that's the Protestant and uh, this is the Protestant chapter numbers. <laughs> So essentially chapter one is the introduction that's in Hebrew. Chapter two is Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the five kingdoms with the statue of the five, uh, that, that represents the five kingdoms. The next is chapter three is the story of the fiery furnace. So both of those are in Aramaic, part of that Aramaic text. Then there is those, those hymns, those psalms that are in Greek. We don't have, um, if they were in Hebrew originals, we don't have them. Uh, related to the story of the fiery furnace, which is why they're stuck in the Greek version after that story. Next, um, this, in, back into the Aramaic text, it's the story of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's madness, then Belshazzar's feast, then this famous story of Daniel and the lion's den, again part of the Aramaic text, then the vision of the beasts that come from the sea in Aramaic, and then the text switches to Hebrew, and we have a vision of the ram and he, uh, he goat. Then we have uh, a 70 weeks prophecy, which is a um, reinterpretation uh, or a change of, of a prophecy that didn't come true from Jeremiah. And so it's recalculating that. And then uh, a, a list of revelations that are brought by the angel Gabriel, again in Hebrew, and then we have that Susanna and the elders story in Greek, and then the idol bell and the dragon stories in Greek. And so that's how it would exist if you were reading it in, for example, the Orthodox or Catholic uh, Bibles. Can we get the microphone to Yvonne? Um, what, does the, what do the uh, asterisks indicate? Oh, it means it's written in that language. <laughs> So I, I should have probably just put those in italics. Instead, I put an asterisk in this thing. That, but it should essentially just be intro written in Hebrew, in other words. So, so clear? So that's kind of a map of what the text looked like. We've already looked at the Greek parts. Now I want to look at that earliest portion, the Aramaic section of the book, um, the Aramaic sections of the book of Daniel. So these are um, Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue, which the interpretation is of uh, that it represents five successive kingdoms. Next, um, Nebuchadnezzar tosses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. Next, Nebuchadnezzar's madness is foretold in a dream that's interpreted by Daniel, then he does go mad. Uh, next, Balthazar's, it is the next king of Babylon's uh, feast, Daniel interprets uh, writing on the wall, which again is going to be about a succession of kingdoms. Um, next, Daniel interprets Balthazar's dream of four beasts that rise up from the ocean. And finally, actually these are backwards. So that should actually, those lines are wrong. The next one is actually Daniel and the lion's den. And then the last one is that, uh, that dream of the four beasts. Those two lines are going to the wrong to the wrong uh, things, but the, the otherwise it's right. And the reason why um, uh, those are numbered, labeled, lettered here instead of, of numbered is that uh, scholars have I detected that in this text all by itself, there is the uh, Hebrew form of chiasmus, which is um, to say, I mean, it's actually, Greeks did it too, but it's, in, it's a form where you essentially uh, start with one kind of component that's fairly similar, you go to another one, you get to the kind of the heart of the matter, and then you go back um, the way you came. So A, B, C, C, B, A, and then, you know, and so it can, it can, in the shortest chiasmus, it can just go A, B, B, A, but they can get much more elaborate. And so the idea here is that on the bookends here, there are um, dreams that are interpreted, visions of a succession of kingdoms, the five kingdoms, the four beasts, um, the, the, the B components are the fiery furnace and getting tossed into the fiery furnace, getting tossed into the lion's den. So those are kind of comparable to each other. And then in the middle um, are, you know, Nebuchadnezzar anyway, the writing on the wall and dream interpretation in the middle, right? Is it point? Okay. 
<clears throat> so just to look at some of those, this includes some of the most famous stories and imagery out of the book. And so a lot of this you'll be familiar with. So uh, the lion's den, Daniel in the lion's den, that's probably the most, <laughs> most famous story here. And so Daniel in the story is essentially promoted, I'm sorry, appointed as prime minister by a character called Darius the Mede uh, in the story. And it's not, he doesn't get called prime minister, but essentially uh, the Median Empire as described here is ruled by satrapies, like the later Persian Empire, and of which there are three, um, the central court uh, appoints three presidents of the satraps. And because Daniel is the most effective of all of those three presidents, they just make him be president of all the satraps all by himself. And this, as you might imagine, makes all the other satraps and all the other uh, courtiers very jealous because now suddenly all of this power is concentrated in this one guy's hands. And so uh, they want to get rid of him, but the problem is that he's uncorruptible and he doesn't do anything wrong and he's you know, perfectly honest in all his dealings and all this sort of thing. And so the only way they're gonna be able to get this to work is through trickery. And so they convince uh, Darius to issue an edict that forbids everybody from praying to any god other than Darius himself for the next 30 days. And if you break the edict, that's punishable by lion's den. <laughs> so you get thrown into, into the lion's den. And so what ends up happening, even though Daniel is aware of that decree, nevertheless, he is very devoted to the worship of the God of Israel. And so he continues to pray in private. He's you know, spied, they know that he's gonna do this, so he's spied upon, he's caught, he's denounced by uh, the other courtiers. And so then Darius, who is really upset that he's been tricked in this way, but he's nevertheless made a decree and he has to fulfill it uh, in order to show that he's uh, you know, good, as, good as his word, uh, reluctantly throws Daniel into the lion's den as a punishment for him breaking the edict. But God sends an angel and the angel shuts all the lion's mouths. And so therefore Daniel's able to survive even though these poor hungry lions would really like to eat some Daniel, <laughs> but <laughs> aren't able to. So then the next morning uh, when, when they throw open the doors and uh, Daniel uh, has survived, um, Darius is, rejoices, he's very, very happy. And then the result of the story is that then Darius has a decree that allows um, the Judeans to have all of their own unique practices. So there's a, uh, an issue of toleration for their particular um, religion and practices that results from this sort of uh, lion's den trickery on the part of the courtiers. So then another one. So the fiery furnace, that's maybe another one that people are aware of. It's um, there's a great song that goes, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the fiery furnace were tossed. So I didn't remember their names that way, but anyway. <laughs> so these guys, um, again, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he's got himself this huge gold idol, uh, but three of uh, his officials who are Judean exiles, um, they all refuse to worship the idol, so they're not gonna, I mean, everybody has to, that's part of, the, again, the degree or the rules, and so as a result of their obstinance and refusal to just do the, um, uh, the, what they're supposed to do anyway in terms of you know, the state religion here, they are cast into a fiery furnace to test whether their God you know, is truly God, and the furnace is so hot that everybody even comes close, like the guards and stuff like that all burn and everything like that, but then these guys, um, uh, are go in there and when people are seeing from afar, they see that there's actually four um, beings together. So just the three of them and then another angel from God who is um, preserving them, right? And so again, they survive miraculously and as a result of this amazing feat, um, we again have uh, uh, the king issue an edict that allows for Jews to have their own practices. This one actually comes earlier. I, I, I use the other one was in the Medes, right? Darius the Mede, this is the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. And I just did the other one. I did them in this reverse order because this one's less famous than the lion's den, right? Okay, so also in the Aramaic texts uh, are some famous visions. So one of them um, is this vision of a statue representing five kingdoms. Um, this maybe aren't as famous to us anymore as it once was, but this was something that um, uh, really uh, captivated the imagination for a long time because more or less what's happened here is that you're, they're outlining essentially periods of history. And so throughout time, people have 
reinterpreted what each one of the different kingdoms are to update it to their own time period, right? But anyway, so Nebuchadnezzar has a vision and there's a statue that has a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet made of mixed iron and clay. He wants an interpretation, but he distrusts all his soothsayers, and so he won't even tell anybody uh, in his court what the vision even was. So he says, I have a dream, and I want you all to interpret it. And all the soothsayers are like, well, pfft, that's not how it works. You have to tell us the dream. <laughs> He's like, no, you have to tell me what my dream was first, and then tell me the interpretation. And so they can't do that, and they, and they say that nobody can do that. Well, it turns out somebody can do that, <laughs> and that somebody is Daniel. And so Daniel, with God's help, is able to relate the dream and its interpretation. So he says what the king saw, and then he says what, he, what the interpretation is. And so the interpretation is, Daniel says, that there will be a succession of these four original kingdoms, um, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and they'll be followed by one of iron mixed with clay. And then there's a, um, after that statue part, the last, last part of the dream is, um, that a hand, uh, I'm sorry, a stone that is uh, carved out of a mountain without hands <coughs> rolls forth and it smashes the statue. And so that's, um, anyway, all of the last kingdoms, in other words, that kingdom of iron mixed with clay will fall because it will be struck by this stone. And so um, the interpretation that's actually included in the text, so it's explicit here, um, is that the first kingdom is Nebuchadnezzar's own kingdom. So that head, that gold head, uh, is Babylon, right? So that's, um, and, then, and then it also explicitly says then that that stone that smashes all the other kingdoms is in fact God's, what we now would call millennial kingdom, but what, they don't have that word yet. So anyway, God's future kingdom, this kingdom of, uh, uh, where God will impose on the earth and we will no longer be living in this uh, era when evil reigns, but instead uh, it will be a period of you know, the peaceable kingdom and justice, and so that will destroy the, all the kingdoms of the world. Um, and so although that's endlessly been reinterpreted, as I mentioned, <laughs> so people have wanted to say what each one of those kingdoms between, so those two are explicit, the millennial kingdom and the Babylon, but what's in between, right? <laughs> and so although it's been interpreted over and over again, the, uh, the text makes the identity quite obvious. And so gold is Babylon, silver is the Medes, bronze is the Persians, iron is Alexander, and then the iron mixed with clay represents the Hellenistic kingdom. So those kingdoms of the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, and, there, and so forth. So um, then another one of the visions is the vision of the four beasts. So Daniel, and this is again from the Aramaic text, Daniel, Daniel similarly interprets a dream of King Belshazzar in which four beasts arise from the sea, and these are a lion with eagle's wings, a bear with three tusks, a leopard with four heads and wings, and a beast with iron teeth and ten horns. So again, although the, in the imagery here, um, the imagery here ends up being very specific in order so that you can have the, um, a, it's not explicitly made, we can tell exactly what he's referring to in terms of the succession, which is the succession of kingdoms from um, Nebuchadnezzar, from the Babylonians, to God's millennial kingdom after the beasts are overthrown. So um, there's another theme that's told more, even more explicitly in that um, handwriting on the wall story that we still use as a, you know, a, um, as a phrase, I can read the writing on the wall, right? And so, or the writings on the wall. Uh, you know, this is uh, what happens in this particular uh, thing. So Balthazar, who's again the king of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar in the story, uh, a hand appears that everyone sees the hand and it writes on the wall and it writes Mene, Mene, Teco, Perez. <laughs> and people wonder, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is that supposed to be for? And so Daniel interprets it, quote, um, as God has numbered your days, that's the, uh, the mene mene, you have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. And finally, uh, Perez here, your kingdom is divided and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. So what's happening here is that the king of Babylon is being told quite explicitly, the writing is on the wall, the Babylonian kingdom is, is through, and now uh, the Medes and the Persians are going to take over uh, your kingdom. So pretty much, you can kind of see a theme you know, through the Aramaic text, which is uh, essentially getting from Babylon, uh, 
which is when the story is set, all the way through the succession of kingdoms till you get to the Seleucid and Ptolemaic period, which uh, is viewed as obviously less stable and less good than even what was in back, what we'll say a golden age, like the age of uh, where the golden head, the age with the silver age, the bronze age, and now an iron uh, age of Alexander himself, and now iron mixed with mud, iron and clay, you know, that's what we're reduced to now in this era, which is to say the era at the time of the author. So how can we tell that? Uh, as always that happens, whenever um, anybody is writing, uh, and this is quite true now, uh, although people are so much more aware of history that you can do a, a much better job, nevertheless, uh, continually happens with still modern forgeries that are continue to be cranked out at a, at a very rapid rate, <laughs> as people um, always want to forge stuff, <laughs> and they always want to, that, uh, that these almost inevitably or always inevitably include, I mean, you're better off the shorter you make the thing, <laughs> but the longer you make it, um, the more likely and the more certainly you're going to include anachronisms. And certainly even, even if a person is an amazingly gifted historian now, people still make anachronisms <laughs> without it, without, anyway. And these guys back then are not amazingly gifted historians. They are writing um, without probably any historical training in some cases, in this, this case, uh, after history has been invented, but not something that they're focused on. So just even hearing, you know, we're kind of hearing all of these different characters. You know, we were talking about Balthazar and uh, Cyrus and Darius and the Mede and um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So it's, in a way, the stories have all of these kind of strange settings that should already kind of be kind of clear. It's a little confused in terms of that actual history, in terms of the past of when the setting for the Daniel story actually is. So the way it's described in the book of Daniel as we have it, and especially as also in the Aramaic version at, the, at its heart, there's essentially the power of succession here comes from Nebuchadnezzar, um, uh, I was going to say, who is later described as the guy who actually is the conqueror of Jerusalem, although that's also an anachronism. Uh, um, but what he, we have here is Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian. It goes then to, from his, and when he goes mad in the story, it goes from his son to his son Balthazar, who is then, um, when he reads the writing on the wall, is overthrown by a character called Darius the Mede, who is then followed by uh, Cyrus the Persian. And so that's the succession of the different kings of Babylon um, as we have it in the story. But in actual history, Balthazar, um, who is not actually king, he's regent, in the very last year of the Babylonian kingdom, 539, he is actually the son of Nabonidus, uh, who is actually four kings then from Nebuchadnezzar. So he's not Nebuchadnezzar's son, so that's an anachronism or an error. Uh, Babylon then is not conquered by some character known as Darius the Mede. There is no such person uh, as Darius the Mede, but it was actually conquered by Cyrus the second, Cyrus the Great, the Persian, uh, in 539 uh, himself. And so then uh, Darius, where they get this name, uh, Darius the Great is actually a Persian, and he begun, begins to rule in 522, eight years after Cyrus's death, not before. So as you can kind of see, the author here um, isn't particularly familiar with the events of the extreme past, which is to say the Babylonian captivity and that early Persian period, uh, and in fact has made fairly serious errors uh, in, in setting the stories. So um, then because of that, the core version of the text uh, the core version, as we saw, is the author's prediction of this succession of kingdoms, and that leads up to what we can assume then is his own day, which is to say the divided um, successors of Alexander. So um, why, do, why do they want to do that? So, you know, the idea of it always, the pious pretense for essentially doing something that is deceitful pretending that it's actually a story that is taking place or that you're an author that is taking place at the time of uh, Daniel, if Daniel were a historic person, uh, said at the same time of, uh, as Nebuchadnezzar or something like that, uh, as opposed to writing it in your own time, is because the author's um, 
actual past, so everything that takes place between Nebuchadnezzar and when the, author is, the real author is actually alive, all of the predictions in between lend to the prophet's credibility, right? Because that, all of those visions, you know, with the, the statue, it's been right up till now. <laughs> So the fact is, we've already occurred what you can, when people are reading this text now, they already can look back and they say, well, wait a second, that's right. That's what way back when, when Daniel was seeing this. Now in our day, um, there was that Babylonian kingdom, then the Medes, then the Persians, then Alexander and his successors. And now, you know, we're in this place uh, where we're, we're having this horrible time with uh, the mixed kingdoms of Med and Clay, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And so having, having gone with you that far and gained that kind of credibility in terms of your prediction, the next part of the vision, the idea that there's going to be a rock you know, carved without hands that smashes the whole thing, which means that God's millennial kingdom is about to be formed so that this world of injustice is going to go away and we're going to instead live uh, in a renewed paradise, that becomes more credible because you can look back and say, well, he got the last 400 years right or 300 years right. So that's much more uh, likely to be our immediate future as people were seeing that. So, so the idea is, is that the author here of the Aramaic Daniel is quite convinced that the end is nigh. So we, it is about to be that end. That change is about to happen. Um, but in order, to, in order to make that message and sell that message, essentially he wrote that into the story, <laughs> setting his story uh, way back in the past. And this is not the um, only one of these, as we saw two weeks ago with our apocalypses uh, and apocalypticism lecture. There's actually, um, we've surviving dozens and dozens of these um, apocalypses from the Second Temple period, which all do the same kind of thing. Um, it'll be like set with the character of Enoch, uh, who is a antediluvian, somebody who is supposedly living before the flood, who has a vision and predicts everything all the way up until the time period when the author of Enoch was alive, which is to say the second temple period, and then predicts the upcoming apocalypse, the end of the world, and the future establishment of the paradisical kingdom. So they all kind of do that, right? And so it's a big genre of which we're familiar, more familiar with Daniel because it's made it into the text and things like uh, the statue, the phrase, the writing on the wall, the lion's den, the fiery furnace, these have become for us um, much more known images as a result of that than the other lost apocalypses or the ones that didn't make it into the canon. Okay, so I just want to read a little bit of it to kind of um, uh, show that. So, predicting the future uh, past events. So, and in those days, I'm sorry, in the days of those kings, which is to say the Hellenistic rulers that mixed, um, uh, mixed clay and iron age, God, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall this kingdom be left to another people. It shall crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as the stone that you saw was cut from the mountain, not by hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has informed the king through this vision, Nebuchadnezzar, has informed Nebuchadnezzar what shall be hereafter. So you've gotten to see the future in your vision. The dream is certain, the interpretation is trustworthy. So because we've seen um, in that dream all of the history of the preceding 300 years as from the perspective of the author and the author's immediate audience, the next thing that's about to happen, this millennial kingdom, uh, is quite assured, right? So the dream is certain, the interpretation is quite trustworthy as far as the book assures us. Okay, so um, the Hebrew editions, as we saw then, taking from that, that original text, that text um, very much appealed to some author who decided to expand it and do a recalculation. So contrary to that original author's prediction, God's kingdom was not established <laughs> in that time period. So it was gonna happen immediately, um, but it doesn't happen. But that doesn't mean that people throw away the text, you know? So they, they are like, well, they dust it off. Let's think about this here. They get out their calculator, abacus or whatever, and they say, wait a second, this whole thing where Jeremiah said that it was gonna take place in 70 years, I bet that means 70 weeks of years, which is to say 70 times seven. Now, it doesn't say that in Jeremiah, but 
it sure, sure makes sense now that I've added it into my calculator <laughs> because now it's going to really work out. And so that's the kind of thing that happens, right? So um, this additional author, who we're going to call in this anyway, the Hebrew redactor, we don't have a name for whoever this would be, believed that these predicted events were occurring right before their eyes in 167. And so in other words, they've read this thing, they're believing all, it didn't happen when the Aramaic text uh, predicted it would, but now that 167 has occurred, and we've talked a little bit about it, we're going to talk a little bit more, when we have this period of time when the temple's being sacked, et cetera, et cetera, the person's reading this and like, this was actually about now. <laughs> And so, like I say, they do the calculations, they realize it is all happening right now, and so then they correct the text or they expand the text in order to convince everybody um, their theory is correct. And so, uh, when we see the expansion here, um, we have that core part that we already saw from the, uh, the Five Kingdoms dream to the Beast's dream and the Lion's Den and the, and the fiery furnace and etc. that's in the middle there, the Aramaic text, and now we have an introduction uh, to the whole thing that's written in Hebrew, which includes more anachronisms, <laughs> but in any event, so just kind of setting the stage. And then we have more visions, which is to say there's a vision of a ram and a he-goat that is written in Hebrew. There is the 70 weeks prophecy, which is going to include all of this Hebrew writer's math that's going to assure everybody in his immediate uh, vicinity that this time period, this date that they are existing in right now is critically important and the whole thing's going to wrap up in three years. And then finally, um, we have more revelations from an angel uh, to round out the Hebrew additional text. So the added, added one, chapter 1, 8, 9, 10, and 11, and 12. So the ram and goat vision. <laughs> so essentially the Hebrew author adds a vision that Balthazar has of a ram with two horns who's defeated by a goat with a great horn. The great horn uh, falls off and then there's uh, replaced by four, or breaks and it's replaced by four lesser horns and then more horns until finally there's just this one little horn that is, ends up being a really terrible horn. <laughs> so, and so uh, that last horn is going to desecrate the temple we find out and uh, will cause all sacrifice and everything like that to cease for 2,000 evenings and mornings. Actually, it's, that's supposed to be 2,300. For 2,300 evenings and mornings. And so there is a, it's kind of, um, the imagery is less, going to be less remote for us, but even if that wasn't um, explicit enough for you, <laughs> the angel spells it out for you. <laughs> so you get the interpretation right in the, uh, the Hebrew additional text here. So the angel Gabriel, um, explains that the ram you saw with two horns, that represents the Medes and the Persians, right? And they're defeated then um, by uh, the Greek horn, right? The Greek animal, which is to say the male goat, which is the kingdom of Greece, the king of Greece. That first horn, you know, that smashed everything, that's Alexander. Uh, that's not explicit, but anyway, it's, what's explicit is that it's Mede, the Medes and Persians and Greeks, but this is going to be pretty obvious that the the big horn is Alexander that breaks into four horns, which is therefore his generals, the successors, the Hellenistic kingdoms. And then finally, um, that one last little horn is going to be Antiochus, as we'll see. So the four horns, the four Hellenistic horns, are the main four kingdoms into which Alexander's empire is split, the kingdoms of Seleucus, Ptolemy, uh, Lysimachus, and Cassander. So we haven't mentioned those other two because they're not as important to the uh, particular story, but it uh, is making it in terms of the vision. It makes, um, you know, essentially the Greek a beast that represents Greece that has one big horn that splits into four horns. It's very explicit what's going on. You know, Alexander and the four generals uh, are those. And then the ongoing succession of horns that lead to that little horn that, uh, that stops um, all sacrifices in the temple. Well, that happens. <laughs> So again, we have Antiochus IV of Seleucia. That was that character we had at the beginning who we said um, had this fight with one of the Ptolemies on his way back. He gets really mad at, uh, at uh, the rebels from his cause essentially in Jerusalem and he uh, desecrates the temple. He stops sacrifice from happening in there. He puts a statue of Zeus there and he forbids uh, Jewish practice, right? So the little horn from the male goat, the Hellenistic kingdoms, that desecrates the temple is clearly Antiochus IV, who desecrates that temple in 167. And that's how we're getting uh, to Elizabeth's point before, um, how we're getting that date so specifically. However, um, this is where 
uh, things go off the rails, <laughs> you know, as far as the predictions of the authors uh, take place, which is why we can also say with fairly much with assurity that it's written just a little bit after that time period. So it's right after or right then, right when uh, that desecration happens. That inspires um, this Hebrew writer to dust off that Aramaic text, update it for the now so that people can understand that this thing that just happened means that we're about to, the world's going to end. And he says it very quite explicitly. So here's the kind of explicit timeline that comes in this, um, this calculation that's coming from that, that 70 years um, uh, prophecy of Jeremiah that now has been miraculously expanded to 70 weeks of years, even though that doesn't exist in Jeremiah's text. So in his visions of 70 weeks of years, which is to say seven-year periods, <laughs> So there's seven days into a week, and this is a week of years, so seven year periods. The angel Gabriel announces very explicit timeline for the end times. So he says, again, set back in Daniel's time, 70 weeks, 490 years, are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. You got 490 years from Daniel, and that's the end of the world. That's it. That's all you guys got. 70 weeks of, of years. So for the first 62 weeks, it, Jerusalem shall be built again with streets and moat, but it'll be a troubled time. After 62 weeks, that 434 years, an anointed prince, in this case, uh, the high priest, so they don't have secular princes, they have the anointed princes, the messiahs here that they're ruling or whatever are the high priests. And in this case, um, the explanation here is that it's almost like, surely uh, Onias III who is killed by the Seleucid governor um, uh, in the year 171 BCE. So an anointed prince will be removed and no one will take his part. So just a few years before um, the author's time here that they're writing. And the troops of an invading prince who is to come out, I mean, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, 167, right? So that's the one time when Antiochus does that. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, which is, remember, that's seven years, right? So one week of years, <coughs> seven, and that should have another bracket at the end of seven years. And for half of the week, three and a half years, he shall make sacrifice and offering cease, and in their place shall be an, an abomination that desolates. And so essentially, what he's counting down from here is he's saying from 171 BC, when Onias III is assassinated, there's only seven years left to the end of the world. And three and a half years in, what's gonna happen is, is that all sacrifice is gonna cease because this invading prince is going to set up an abomination that desolates, which is to say the statue of Zeus in the temple. And so that's going to make it so the temple's desecrated and that's all going to cease. And so that has already happened for anybody who is alive for him in one, I'm sorry, in the year 167, because they see that happened in 171 and now it's already to 167. And so what does that mean? Three and a half years to doomsday, guys. That's all we got left. So. Um, this is following Randall Helm's reading of Daniel. So in other words, his reconstruction of this uh, uh, redactor's math. Um, this Hebrew redactor then feels like he's living in the world's final seven-year period, so its last week of years, that began then with this assassination of the high priest. And by the time he's writing the text, it's at least already half gone. And so his expectation was that the world would end half a week after 167 BCE, in other words, in the year 164, and then there's all kinds of additional things that are going to happen. One of the things is Daniel has promised that he'll be resurrected at that moment, so there'll be a uh, resurrection, and then uh, again, all of the kingdoms of the world will be destroyed, and God's kingdom will roll forth and fill the entire earth, and now we'll be in this kind of peaceable kingdom uh, that will be just and good thereafter, right? Okay. <laughs> that point, all the predictions fail, right? So in the lead up into the everything uh, that is predicted from Daniel's time up until the time of the Hebrew redactor, uh, 
all of those track really, really good. I mean, it's quite anachronistic back in Daniel's time, but as it gets closer and closer to the redactor's time, it becomes extremely precise to within three and a half years uh, in terms of the chronology here. But what ends up happening is, uh, after just three years, um, the temple is, as opposed to three and a half, which is pretty close, <laughs> but anyway, the temple um, uh, is restored, but that restoration um, doesn't uh, take, isn't, in other words, doesn't take place because of the end of history. <laughs> and there's no resurrections or anything else. Uh, instead of the apocalypse, the temple's rededicated uh, in 165 BC. Uh, and so we, instead of the apocalypse, we get Hanukkah, right? <laughs> uh, and so there's that uh, story of that uh, miracle in terms of the rededication that, that the author's not aware of. So that doesn't make it into Daniel. So even though um, you know, he's quite aware of Antiochus's desecration, there's no awareness of the re-consecration, and so as a result, we can tell it's before that happens. Uh, and indeed, because of this calculus, since he's expecting the world to end right after that, or half a year later, um, that's also, uh, anyway, a way to track exactly when it's written. So in the course of this then, um, Jerusalem then becomes the capital of the Hasmonean or Maccabee kingdom, um, which then kind of emerges out of this rebellion and revolt. Get um, Shaheen, I'm sorry, could I have uh, the microphone to June? June. Um, just sorry, uh, what's the story of Hanukkah? So the story of Hanukkah is as they're trying to, after this desecration, uh, as they're trying to uh, rededicate the temple, they have insufficient oil in order to um, cause, uh, you know, they need to do, perform the rituals in order to re-consecrate. And so ha lacking um, sufficient oil, it's still able to uh, last for all of the, the nights, right? And so this is the one um, major uh, Jewish, rabbinic Jewish holiday that uh, isn't actually from, it isn't part of the, um, the Hebrew Bible, right? And so the, the story is actually recounted in the, uh, the books of Maccabees, which are in the Catholic and Orthodox Bible, but are not in the, Hebrew, uh, the Jewish or Protestant canons. But anyway, people get the story by reading it as a history. Rudy, do you want to comment? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> so as we saw in our um, lecture on apocalypticism, <laughs> apocalypticism, you know, the failure of apocalyptic prophecy um, even if you explicitly give out dates, and a lot of times, like with Daniel, it's, it's pretty clear, but it's not, you know, it doesn't exactly, it's not totally explicit about everything, you know, so some of it is explicit, but not all of it. So it rarely, though, results in the re rejection of the prophecy. So people are committed, they're in for a dime, they're in for a dollar. Um, rather than admit that they were wrong and move on with their life, they tend to become more committed, and they just go back to the abacus, right, and they just figure out, wait a second, I thought it was 70 weeks of years, but it actually, you know, is every day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And so now we're talking about the year, you know, 2000 and, you know, uh, 21, <laughs> you know, <and> so, <laughs> okay. So calculating, recalculating, recalculating. So although then that calculations then of the original authors of Daniel failed, both the uh, original Aramaic author and then the more explicit calculation of the Hebrew redactor failed. Their visions and these imagery of it continued very much to inspire. And so, uh, frankly, empire after empire has um, seen themselves as the, you know, the successor. So it didn't take very long before people now started to see um, the Iron Kingdom is Rome, <laughs> you know, or something like that, as opposed to Alexander, right? And so it essentially gets uh, reinterpreted as time goes on, uh, depending on as you know, updated to where we are in the present. So when the Romans destroyed the temple, uh, the second temple in the year 70 AD of the common era, um, the author of the Gospel of Mark, for example, dusted off the book of Daniel <laughs> and said, whoa, wait a second, this is all occurring now. Well, everything that was talking about here, you know, about this now less remembered uh, crisis that was happening, uh, oh, you know, over two centuries ago, um, that's not what we were talking, what Daniel was talking about here. It was talking about my time when the Romans were coming and destroyed the temple, right? And so 
Um, that's also true then for John the Revelator, who also updates Daniel's visions of beasts and things like that and bring them down more or less to the present. So that vision as updated by Mark and Revelation and as continues in Daniel, uh, continue then to inform the apocalyptic imagination today as we saw in our lecture on apocalypses and apocalypticism. But then I'm going to argue <laughs> that perhaps instead of focusing on the math and continuing to try to um, make sense of this um, failed prophecy and bad math and try to end this literal reading of a destruction time and signs of the end, um, I think everybody's effort would be much better spent if we focused not on the um, time frame or the destruction part, but instead we thought about the vision of what's supposed to come after which is to say building a world um, of justice and peace uh, and hopefully also respect for the environment, <laughs> all these kind of things, uh, in order to then build you know, for ourselves that envisioned peaceable future. And so that's the book of Daniel, it's Pius Fred. <laughs> Did that all make sense or are there questions or comments or? <laughs> On. Yeah. To, to the north of uh, Seleucia, there were a number of small kingdoms varying from uh, um, Bithynia to Galatia to yes. Media Atropane. What, what does Media Atropane mean? So what does Media Atropane mean? So it would mean a uh, Median kingdom that is, has its capital at Atropane. And so essentially what those are is that um, in addition to the great empires that emerge, that at a certain point when those empires are, cease to exercise authority over the individual com constituent parts, those map makers start to decide are functionally independent. And so um, one of the things about how the Persian Empire even functioned, um, and even is alluded to a little bit in Daniel, is the sense that there is a... Um, imperial military slash uh, class, Persian class that is, you know, in charge. And, but then what they actually are doing is they are ruling over um, relatively autonomous uh, little kingdoms, which where they have a, a Persian authority that's called a satrap. And so there might be the satrap of Lydia, which, is the head, which was founded on the old Lydian kingdom in Anatolia, or what's now Turkey. Uh, and so then uh, that Lydian satrap is a Persian appointed official and so they have to pass on the taxes to the centralized state. They have to send um, uh, troops or whatever else that they're required to give but otherwise they might be conducting everything in Lydian law pretty much as it always had been. And so at a certain point when under those kind of circumstances uh, when the central authority weakens then the little satrapy is suddenly a kingdom again. <laughs> because it just is functioning where the local appointed official, instead of getting a new appointed official, a new satrap, maybe it becomes the guy's son. <laughs> and so once that happens a couple times, you know, it doesn't take too long before that son is a king, right? And so, uh, and that's certainly also happening um, in the Jewish revolt. So um, it's more explicitly a revolt where they have an armed revolution, but essentially the central, what's happened is fairly light um, imperial oversight is uh, replaced with kind of warfare and then finally no control at all. So then the, uh, the Syrian kingdom can no longer exercise any authority over the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans and the Herodians, uh, until the Romans get into the Eastern Mediterranean and kind of reimpose their authority over all of the Hellenistic world. And at that point, the Hasmoneans and then their successors, Herod and Herod's descendants, aren't, aren't their own masters. So Herod is very, very rich, but he gets to be king because um, at a certain point he runs to Rome and he is able to lobby, and which is to say bribe, you know, enough senators that they, they kind of make a snap judgment and surprise, he's now king. And everybody back in, in Judea is like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? Why, this guy's not a Maccabee. He's married to one of the princesses, but he shouldn't be, you know, why did that happen? But it's because they, don't, they can't make their own decisions anymore. Rome is in charge at that point. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we, we know about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, yes. What is the origin of the books that has, you've been interpreting here? 
Where do, where do they come from other than the Dead Sea Scrolls? Oh, so, so other than the Dead Sea Scrolls, although there we do have the earliest manuscripts that are preserved are from the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? <laughs> because, the, because everything else that we have is the manuscript tradition. And so um, from ancient times, which is to say uh, so the time that they were writing the Dead Sea Scrolls, <laughs> and also simultaneously in Egypt, uh, when they translated into Greek, those ancient texts, uh, other than the ones that get put in the jars and buried in the Dead Sea, those of old the originals have all, are all gone, but they're copied again and again and again by, uh, in the West by monks and nuns and who are uh, making continual copies of, for example, the Septuagint, the Greek version, and then in terms of the, um, the Hebrew version, those are copied by the rabbis and, so, and the scribes. And so those have continued down to the present day. And so there's a living manuscript tradition that took us all the way to the modern times uh, and, then, and then the printing press. And so then, uh, and then subsequently, um, when we have done our checking, uh, you know, so we check the uh, literary criticism, the lower criticism, the textual criticism of all the changes and corrections and errors that creeped in. It turns out that the, um, both groups were really quite good at not making mistakes. <laughs> So even though you might think that all the time that, you're, um, that the text will be quite corrupted by the time you get to the end of the Middle Ages, in point of fact, the rabbis had a pretty good technique for not screwing up. <laughs> and uh, between all of the texts that were occurred in the West, the, the, each individual text might be, have a lot of errors in it. But in general, we preserved the text pretty good. Although, like you say, with the, with the rediscovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we're getting uh, manuscripts that are in some cases, you know, whatever, hundreds of years old, older than our earliest, earliest manuscript. Um, and so in that case, the text we're really talking about here is all Daniel. And so since it's part of the canon, it survives in thousands of manuscripts. And the Dead Sea, um, the Qumran people had eight copies of it, although none, none of them is complete, I think. And so I think the Dead Sea Scrolls includes Daniel, uh, but different components of it, but they don't have the whole thing. But if we, as we look at it, I think um, as with most other texts of the Hebrew Bible, um, the preserve, preserved text is quite good. And they had that unfortunate little fire at Alexandria Library. Yes. Well, so the, one of the stories of the Alexandrian Library is that it always burned. <laughs> and so we actually had, um, we actually have like multiple different accounts of people burning down the Library of Alexandria. So it happens with Caesar, it happens uh, in a, in the, when the Muslims take over, there's all kinds of different times when it's destroyed, the Christians maybe, you know, but in point of fact, um, manuscripts have to be copied in order to survive. And so some libraries were, were often burning and we obviously, anything that we lost is very sad, but in a way, everything, anything that you, anybody didn't bury, if they had just, if those librarians in Alexandria had just been, you know, every 10 years, just taken a big jar, filling it all up with manuscripts, walking out into the desert, you know, outside of where there's any um, waterfall and everything like that and burying it, you know, we would be a lot better off today than them saving all the ones they didn't bury because eventually those are all lost. <laughs> what? Assuming we found them. Well, eventually we'll find them. I wish they did it with a lot more of them. We found the one, we found the Nag Hammadi <laughs> ones, we found the Dead Sea Scroll ones. There's a bunch of other ones that have survived too in Egypt. Egypt is fantastic for preserving um, uh, all this literature because of there's no Air, air moisture. And so um, one of the other things that we have is almost all of our provincial records from the um, Roman Empire, you know, like anything that was happening in, in Germania Superior or Britannia, that's all being written on papyrus as well, exported from Egypt, but that's all destroyed. <laughs> you know, all of those provincial records have all, you know, molded away and are gone. But all the records that were off in Egypt, or not all of them, a bunch of them got um, put into big piles and thrown into um, just refuse piles and things like that, and those got buried, <laughs> and then now we have those. And so almost all of our, um, um, just l let's say, not important, <laughs> provincial minutia that now is very important for us because it lets us understand how the Roman administration worked, but it only allows us, unfortunately, to see how it worked in kind of a unique province of Egypt. But anyway, Egypt's wonderful for that. So, Yes, it's in, uh, yeah, in Judy. Jew, in Jewish prayer books, uh, some of the prayers are in Aramaic, but yes. they're written in Hebrew script, uh, Hebrew letters. How did that happen? So, in fact, you have it the opposite. <laughs> So 
there, some of them are in Aramaic, written in Aramaic script, and some of them are in Hebrew, written in Aramaic script. So the script that we have, that we think of now as being the Hebrew alphabet, you might think of, we might think of our own letters as being English letters, but in fact, all of our English letters are Roman letters, right? And so that's actually the Roman alphabet. Likewise, um, there was, in the first temple period, um, before the original destruction of the original Jerusalem temple, there was an archaic Hebrew alphabet uh, alphabet that was separate from the Aramaic alphabet. In other words, they both are from a related language, Phoenician, which is probably where uh, it's uh, first written or the first alphabet and the other kind of uh, those languages. That evolves into different variations though, uh, one of which is Aramaic. And the Aramaic alphabet is the one that then replaces the Hebrew alphabet for the writing of Hebrew. And so now, because they're again, they're related languages, they're both using that Aramaic alphabet. Then that further evolved um, uh, into Arabic. So Arabic is a related script that is again based on the Aramaic, I think. So, oh, yeah, next. Yeah. I sang in church choirs for years and heard many sermons. Almost all of them I have forgotten. <laughs> but I remember, for some reason, a preacher talking about the story of the three boys in the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. And yes. he pointed out, number one, they weren't boys. Right. They were grown men, they were high officials. That's right. Number two, their names were not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those would have been their uh, Babylonian, Babylonian names. names, but yes. their real names would have been Hebrew names. And the third thing he said was that you got to remember if you're in trouble, an angel is probably not going to come and rescue you. Yeah. <laughs> well, Im it's Im important, important sermon information, actually. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, Ivan has a comment. Well, actually, oh. uh, you know, one of the Jewish ideas is that, that uh, uh, miracles do happen, but don't live your life uh, waiting for them. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's also good advice, right? <laughs> Uh, how is Daniel treated in the uh, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox biblical traditions? How, in what versions does it survive? And maybe even in the Ethiopian to yeah, complicate sure. the whole matter. Yeah. So in the in the Catholic, I'm sorry, yeah, in the Catholic, Orthodox, and Ethiopian versions, um, it is derived from the Septuagint, which includes then this larger Greek tradition, right? So it includes the stories of, of the idol bell and the dragon, the story of Susanna, and also these prayers of um, the three Jews, the three Hebrews, and of, the, of Azariah. And that's actually where we get the Hebrew names uh, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who I don't actually know. <laughs> but anyway, those are, those aren't in the, those are not in the um, Hebrew text, but they're in that additional Greek text. Um, and so that's how it survived in that tradition. In the, um, in the rabbinic tradition and in the Protestant tradition, so in the rabbinic tradition you have the, um, the Hebrew and Aramaic version only. You don't have the Greek editions. Those are discarded. So the rabbis, um, after, like I say, what I think, you know, in reading some into their motivations, I think that they um, rightly, for the, from their perspective, saw this emergence of um, Greek Christianity as, you know, as a catastrophe to, you know, how they understood their religion. And so the fact that uh, there's all of these, you know, um, people who are now, you know, they're coming from a religion that is originally founded by Jews, but now includes all these non-Jews and it ha and includes very rapidly all of these um, Greek ideas that, um, that has diverged a lot. The rabbis um, rolled that back a bit, got rid of a lot of this Greek stuff, <laughs> that they had been flirting with, including the Septuagint. And for example, when we talked about, we had a lecture before on Philo of Alexandria, a very important uh, Hellenistic Jewish thinker from Alexandria. That's preserved by the Christians. The Jews don't preserve that textually. So um, the, Bab the Babylonian Talmud is um, privileged. And, uh, and then uh, the idea to go back and use the texts uh, in Hebrew and then, then having the uh, the Talmud and everything is composed in Aramaic, so that the Hebrew and Aramaic become the focus for Rabbinic Judaism, which is the successor to Second Temple Judaism. And then um, 
And then finally for Protestants, Protestants um, looked at, you know, they went and see it, to, they were interested in language. They wanted to translate into their own languages, but they didn't want to translate from Greek when they knew it was a Hebrew original. So they went and visited the synagogues. They got Hebrew texts. They translated, for example, directly from Hebrew into English or German or that kind of thing. But they realized, wait a second, this book of Daniel's different, <laughs> you know. And so, and so they took those additional Greek sections out and they um, preserved them in what Protestants call the Apocrypha. And so each of those is a separate book of the Apocrypha. So the hymn of, um, uh, of Asan, whatever, I can't remember, Azariah and the, and the song of the three Hebrews, the uh, story of Susanna and the idol bell and the dragon are three separate books in the Apocrypha. Other questions or comments? <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. I think this was a lot of fun. <laughs>